So I have a background in two fields. I'm both a biologist. I'm actually have studied um, in the fields of ecology and developmental biology. That's what I, I did a PhD in that quite a few years ago. Um, but I also did art school at the same time. I studied photography and I ended up becoming a full-time artist after uh, finishing my PhD and I started incorporating biology and technology. And um, life is full of meandering pathways and circles. I actually, because of my uh, art projects in which I really combined in a very intricate way uh, biology and technology with a very futuristic look, I ended up working for space agencies again and I just um, completed a few months ago a mission for NASA, a Mars simulation, I think as most of you know, the high seas mission. And I'm currently working on a PhD at Delft University of Technology, which is an art and technology PhD on starship design. So I'm actually doing uh, much more science again than I did a few years ago. So for me, it's all about uh, combining art and science, thinking about the future and bringing that to communities literally all over the world. I'm active in South America, in Southeast Asia, in Europe and America. I'm building communities to combine uh, all of these things, art, science, and uh, yeah, and community building. Great, thanks. Um, so Sanjoy says in the chat, PhD in Starship Design, wow. Can you talk a little bit more about yeah, that, I'm not, what that actually Yeah, means? I know it sounds a little like, oh my God, this is it almost like, it took me, it took me a while to um, to actually embrace it and come out with that idea. But it's really something I really um, I feel very strongly about. Um, the thing is, I decided to do this because, how to put the story? The original, my original entry in the world of space exploration actually happened through a very specific research program at the European Space Agency, which is called MELISA. And MELISA is a artificial ecosystem that's supposed to be used for future space settlement. It's like this um, regenerative ecosystem that recycles all molecules that come out of a human body. That's how I always put it. CO2, sweat, toilet waste, everything gets broken down and used to grow food and plants again. So it's this circling system. And because of starting to work with them, mostly as an artist, um, I got really interested in the future of space systems and thinking beyond the Apollo paradigms that actually we're still using and for example introducing biology in a very radical way in future space exploration was something that I felt I could contribute to and this eventually led uh, to the idea of starship design. Um, my ideas about starship design is it's, it's, uh, I'm not working on the, in the field of propulsion or the topic of propulsion. Uh, there, are quite, there are a lot of other people doing that that are much more qualified than me to do that. I'm actually approaching other aspects of starship design and there are two pillars in which I'm developing my ideas in my PhD. Um, the first one is radically integrating biology, technology and social systems. So people, astronauts, uh, ecosystem and then the technology of a spacecraft to really bring that together as a, an intricate integrated system which means that it's different than having a, a small compartment where you have some biology and keep it like separate in the architecture of the starship, but really embedding it in a much more radical way, uh, both functional and, and conceptual. So I'm, I'm, that's one of the things that I want to uh, accomplish or at least explore. And the second pillar is evolvability. It's to develop, um, to basically rethink uh, space systems from an evolvable point of view. Um, the goal of thinking about evolvable systems is pretty much maximizing resilience. If we're sending out a structure that has to survive for at least 50 or 100 years, it might be very interesting to at least have some evolvable capacity so it can actually handle uh, changing environments and changing um, challenges. And the evolvability is not, so, not restricted to the technology, but is actually I'm applying that overall on those three systems that I just talked about. So both the social system, the ecosystem, and the technology all will have evolvable qualities and will be able to tap into that when it's needed. So it's a very holistic approach and a very biologically inspired approach. And that's how I hope that I can come up with some uh, fresh concepts for uh, starships. Yeah, it sounds, uh, I, we have questions in the chat, but it sounds to me like you're focusing more on like humans actually living long-term in space. Yeah. and having a comfortable environment and it being sustainable. 
Is that correct? Or um, and it's yeah, yeah. Well, hmm. it sounds a little IKEA. I know it does. <laughs> it does. But <laughs> I guess my like question this. is more because um, you're coming sort of from the arts perspective too. What the actual contribution is for for humans actually living in space, just from you know the the nuts and bolts of what's actually. Yeah, but the thing is, there. I'm actually. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I'm getting fascinated by building a concept of community which is different than what the, the sort of community that we use now mm. and really making a, uh, a, a, a leveled field in which technological agents, biological, biological organisms and humans can collaborate together. Actually, that's really what I'm much more interested in instead of everything serving the purpose to make mm. life for humans comfortable. I'm much more thinking about a horizontal structure and in a very radical way. So it's like co-creation, but co-creation by three parties that are actually be able are able to sort of communicate or work together. I mean, that's a very conceptual framework, yeah. but it's, it's, a, it's a shift. It's a really a shift in perspective. A very radical shift. Yes. And yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, so we have a question from the chat that says, could you describe your experience in high seas and how good do you think it was as a true analog for life on Mars? Oh, well, how much time do you have? <laughs> it's uh, it's not easy to just simply summarize what happened during during high seas, of course. I mean, it was a, a, well, definitely for me personally, it was a life-changing experience. Um, oh, where to start? Um, it's been... We, ha we actually had a... One of the things that I discovered is, uh, well, kind of logical, but the humans are the most... The psychology is the most is the most difficult thing, basically. Um, luckily, we had a low drama crew, and our principal investigators did a really good job in selecting us. So it's it's pretty much about crew composition. Um, if you ever end up applying for an, a mission like this and you're not selected, it's not necessarily because you're not qualified, but it might as well be because you're not compatible or not really uh, fitting the slot that they that they want you to fill in. Um, so I actually liked it a lot, and there is an addictive quality to, to this life. Um, I think it's because life becomes very uh, simplified, um, and I'm a people person, and I was a crew commander, so for me this was perfect. You know, I could deal with people every single day and just follow up the crew, and um, I focused very much on crew cohesion. It's one of my main, that was one of my main focus points. Uh, to keep the group together, and I think I think we pulled it off. I mean, we we hardly had conflicts. Of course, there's every now and then you have a discussion, but you know it was pretty, like I said, pretty low drama. Um, is this a real Mars analog? Well, you know, in order to build a Mars base on a location like uh, the Mauna Loa where we were, and to make it fully Mars compatible, that would take a huge budget, which we didn't, which we absolutely didn't have. So we're more like, I think it's typically for analogs, you're um, simulating certain aspects of a mission to Mars. There were certain aspects that were not simulated, like uh, we did get uh, fresh water resupply every, every now and then when we needed it. Um, but at the same time, we were really working on developing a food system for future space settlement. And that was as close as we could get it, you know, just uh, the kind of food that we, we had available. So that was pretty realistic. So depending on which aspect you're looking at, it's going to be more or less uh, uh, true to an actual Mars mission. I felt that um, living in that environment on, uh, on, on Mauna Loa and never having fresh air, living in a small space, um, talking about Mars and about life out, out there, definitely had a big impact. I remember when I came out, I was having a lot of issues with small talk. I just couldn't socialize anymore <laughs> because all those things people talk about, they seem so so little. And then you're, you're, you've been focused so much, like four months on this big issue, this big picture of the future of humanity and outer space and suddenly you're back on earth and everything is just... And it's only later that I realized uh, what was going on. You can keep talking, that's fine, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> We're so back. I yeah sorry. Okay. Um, We're back here. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I I don't feel like I did a good job explaining my experience of of high seas. The problem is that it's such a, uh, it's been such a, a a wide experience that I'm, I'm I don't even know where to start. I mean, um, I've been dealing with science. 
doing my own scientific research with a lot of autonomy, which was hugely motivating. Imagine astronauts being able to do their own research when they're in the space station, for example, which is impossible right now, but that's a huge difference, and that's basically the situation that we were allowed, so that was, that was really great. But also, in my leadership, I really evolved, and I really understood much more how I deal with people and how I can deal with people, and that I actually really enjoy doing this. And I was also using my arts background. I'm working on a photo book that uh, will, will, you know, is a collection of photos that I made during the mission. So I've been exploring all these aspects, and I can talk for hours about each one of them, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm actually a little curious, because you said that they pick people that are uh, compatible. Do you know how they actually make that decision? Based on your application, do you have any insight into that? Well, it probably depends from um, from analog to analog. In high seas, well, the way we were selected, I'm not saying it's going to repeat itself for the next few missions because there's going to be three more years of funding for high seas. So several missions are coming up. Um, we were being put together with nine people in June as a first training. And we knew that out of our nine group of nine, six would be prime crew and three would be backup crew. And based on our interactions during the training of, it took about a, a week, um, the principal investigators actually made a selection. But they also interviewed each person after that initial training to gauge their relationship with the other eight people. So they could kind of figure out uh, if, if the choices that they already had in, in mind would, were actually a reality. And... Um, I think what what was being used by Kim Binstead, for example, when she explained how they chose, she was one of the principal investigators, University of um, Hawaii. Uh, she talked about psychological compatibility. However, this was not done with statistics. This was strictly observing people interacting, and how you know how people how easily people connect. I think. Um, an element of potential friendship is really crucial. I think you can easily see that when you see people interacting, which people could become friends. And, you know, I became close with a few of my crew members and I consider them uh, quite close friends, even, uh, you know, even, even up to today, even though we, we don't live together anymore. Um, so that was really a part of it, but also uh, the skill set, of course. And um, the only way you can participate in these missions is if you have at least two specializations in very different fields. All of us were like this. I mean, I was visual artist, community organizer, scientist, already three things. But every one of us either was a pilot and a geologist or an, uh, an ex-military and a robotics engineer. I mean, all these combinations of things. And so if you put together six people like this with multiple skills that are not, all, all of them are not overlapping, then you've got a, a huge diverse skill set, which is absolutely crucial for a mission. Very cool. Um, so one of the questions we have in the chat is if you could discuss some of the psychological experiences and stresses that you mm. had during the mission. Yeah, difficult question that is, because um, hmm. I, I, need to, I need to write these, these things down before they slip, they, they, before I lose them, because of course it's already three months since I, it came out. And now that I get these questions, I'm like, oh my God, I might start forgetting all this. Yeah. Um, psychological stress is it's really not easy. I mean, I, did, I remember that about three weeks before the end of the mission, I was like, you know, I, I'm kind of done. I think I'm, I'm, I'm done. Um, I don't learn anything new anymore. And the only reason I can keep going is I feel I can learn. You know, I'm not an operator who can just keep on repeating exactly the same thing every single day. I'm, I'm, a, I'm very much a curious person, so I need to learn. Uh, but then again, then what happened is that during those last three weeks, I set up some an, an additional experiment. I gave a last boost to my photography project. And basically, by the end of the mission, I was actually like, oh, I want to stay one more month just to complete everything. And I, wouldn't, I really wouldn't have mind if they, uh, they extended the mission with a few more weeks. I would have immediately done it. So that, that was a bit of a shift in motivation. But I, I think it's kind of typical that productivity ramps up at the end of an isolation mission. I think you can see that in other missions as well. Um, so that's the motivational thing. But the fact that we were so autonomous, so we got a high degree of autonomy, which is quite unusual for space exploration. And this was specifically chosen uh, or decided by the mission organizers, by the principal investigators, because they believe that, and I, I shared that, opinion that if we want to send people to deep space, whether it be Mars or beyond, uh, we have to grant them a lot of autonomy, much more than this. I mean, there's not so much autonomy right now. 
Um, first of all, because you can't keep communi you can't communicate properly with crews that are this far away, so that would generate all kinds of problems. And secondly, something that I experienced very much myself and with the whole crew is that uh, autonomy is extremely motivational. For, for mental health, it is one of the strongest things you can put in place. It's one of my big lessons that I learned during this mission. And um, so I think that's that for the future, that's going to be important. Um, stressors, I think um, time was a kind of a stressor because, and it happens very quickly, um, time is warped very fast once you're in isolation. Um, I'm doing isolation missions in my art projects, in my community art project. I've started doing isolation missions as well. We isolate ourselves in our artworks. Artworks are like spaceships that we design um, in museums, for example. And the same thing happens there. We're, for example, isolating ourselves for 48 hours in an artwork in a museum and everything is there. It's sanitary provisions and water supply and, and things to cook and can sleep there. But even after two days, we have we start feeling that warping of time. I don't, I'm not sure what the, what on earth is happening with, uh, is up with that. Um, so what happened is during high seas, the weeks would just fly by super fast. So every Friday we were like, oh my God, another week. Um, I think one of the reasons is definitely, definitely the autonomy that we got, which made us overwork. I think most of us, we overworked. Uh, and that's why of course time is just, it's just, yeah flowing through your fingers like quicksand you just can't grasp it and it kind of it becomes a bit of a pressure so luckily we you know we had our system that every sunday we had a day off and that was a hugely important day to just recharge batteries and you could just lock yourself up in your room and just stay out there um, i think the stressors of a mission like this are also related to the position you have of course i mean it's not it's pretty obvious to the position you have within the group and so the stressors that i had as a commander must have been very different than as a regular crew member. Um, for me, my focus was on a daily basis, keeping people communicating and keeping the group together. And that requires energy, of course, and focus. But the thing is, I'm a people person, so even if I don't really focus, if I don't actively focus on it, I can't help myself. Put me with a group of people and I will start automatically analyzing relationships and trying to intervene when things are not going. I just, that's how I am. So it doesn't require energy, but at the same time, um, you need a lot of negotiation, a lot of talking. So that, that, that's definitely something that, you know, you need to be able to do that for months on end without getting tired of it. I don't know if, if that's yeah. enough. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you were really busy. What was like an average day like during this mission? Yeah, an average day was like, um, we had breakfast at 8.45. So, you know, you could get up. But the thing is, before breakfast, you either did, for example, your workout. I never did that. I needed a bit more sleep. Uh, but we all also had a, a light dose experiment that we were uh, doing during the mission. So which meant that we had like 45 minutes of light exposure before breakfast. So you had to get up sooner to get your light exposure. So um, in any case, at 8.45, we had our breakfast, which took about half hour. Uh, there was always two people that were responsible for the meals during one day and every single day it would be another combination of two people. So you would always check the night before whether you had to prepare breakfast. Um, and then after breakfast we would roll automatically, we would empty the, empty the table and roll into the morning meeting, which was an absolutely crucial moment of the day uh, just to make sure we're all attuned. And one of the things that I, one of the rules that I used was that during the morning meeting everybody would talk about their plan of the day. And I would really demand everybody to speak up. I, I, and this, I think, was very beneficial for collaboration because we set up several collaborations during the mission. And I kind of take pride in the fact that um, I developed a, a culture of sharing very much on a daily basis. We were sharing all, all the things we were doing. So everybody was constantly very aware of each other's activities. It's very different than a bunch of scientists sitting together and they have no clue what the other person is doing. And I really wanted to avoid that. And that's why I think we set up so many collaborative projects that were not anticipated before. Um, and then after the morning meeting, people were, would start working on their projects. Uh, some, um, for me, for example, I would do my workout after, after the morning meeting. Uh, then we would have lunch. All the meals were supposed to be shared. If you really didn't feel like it, you could opt out. That was not a problem, but it was really the rule that you would try to share the meals with everybody. And basically, I think we shared meals every single time, pretty much. Um, and then we would roll into the afternoon, which would usually fly by like, like really fast. 
and then in the evening I would do my commander round. Uh, basically, after dinner I would wa I would uh, have a short chat with every single person. That's okay. I would have a short chat with every single person. Is it still recording? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I would uh, I would talk with every single person in the crew just to know what's what was going on, and I would write my commander report. And then in the evening we had to do a whole list of um, questionnaires. So by the time I was actually ready and uh, at ease, it was pretty, pretty. It got pretty late. It was usually around eleven or midnight or something before I was really like at ease. And then I had the habit of staying up late, which was not a good habit because it, I I got some sleep deprivation because of that. Um, so every day for me was pretty much working until uh, one a.m. or even two a.m. That was my typical work day. Uh, and sometimes I would even play a game before going to bed. So yeah, I played computer games on Mars. <laughs> That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so this was a food study also, right? Yes. What this... was the outcome of, of that study? So the first high seas mission, every high seas mission will have a different focus. The f this first high seas mission was um, primarily a food study to, to develop, like I said before, uh, to develop a food study, a food system for future space settlement. Um, one of the big issues in, st in space exploration or in long-term space exploration is menu fatigue which is not typical just for space, the military also have that. And it's actually a psychological phenomenon which is used in a lot of diets. Um, if you repeat the same kind of foods uh, over a long period of time, people do start to believe they're not really hungry. They actually are, their body actually needs more food, but it's a psychological thing. Um, and you don't want skinny astronauts to arrive on Mars or anything, so we need to, we need, we need to deal with that. So. One solution that we uh, suggested was like, well, you know, once the astronauts are living on a planetary surface for an extended period of time, why not allow them to cook? So we had a whole bunch of shelf-stable ingredients and we were allowed to experiment with that and to come up with recipes. And so the goal was really, we had always two days of pre-prepared food, astronaut food, and then two days of cooking. And for every portion that we put on a plate, we had to film it, we had to weigh it and we had to evaluate it. So that is a lot of data, I can tell you. Like six people, three meals a day for four months. So all these data are currently being analyzed to see if there's any evolution in food patterns and preferences. Um, so I'm very curious to see what, com what comes out of that. Of course, um, subjectively, I can already make a few conclusions. Um, pretty uh, predictable, but the days when we were cooking were, of course, way more popular than the pre-prepared days. That's, uh, <laughs> that's something that was to be expected. Uh, pretty much because we had some really talented cooks in the crew. I do not consider myself one of those. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of basic, quite a medium, medium style or medium skilled cook, but some of my crew members were just absolutely amazing. It was a, such a joy to... Uh, to, to see what they did. Uh, there's many bene additional benefits that, ha that are uh, connected to uh, the uh, culture of cooking in, uh, in, a, in an isolation experiment. First of all, because we established a system of having two people working together in the kitchen every single day, a, a different team, everybody got to work with everybody. And these are moments that people connect and they start talking. So for crew cohesion, it's, it's fantastic. But also, and this is something that I discovered during the mission, when you're in isolation, you start craving outlets for creativity. It's the same walls, the same people, the same environment, day after day after day. So anything you can create for, from, as, as, as new um, is something you, it has a tremendous impact. So coming up with kind of a new experiment is, a new, ex, a new experimental dish is a huge sense of, of gratification. And then very crucial, um, if you build a culture like that around food, as soon as you put the food on the table, the whole crew starts discussing it. So all this really leads to a much improved crew cohesion, an overall uh, increased happiness and actually a much better productivity. So I think we really bumped into some very interesting strategies for future space, tra space uh, travel. Great. Yeah, we have a lot of questions coming up in the chat now, so I'm just going to pick some that are yeah. related to what you're talking about now. Um, so just carrying on the food theme, what were, were some of the best cooked dishes you had during the entire experience. Yeah, I get, that, I get that question a lot. <laughs> the thing is, I only remember the last ones because, of course, after four months and after experimenting so so many times, it um, becomes a little difficult to remember every single thing. But um, 
one of the, some of the things that were really interesting to cook with were, for example, let me first talk about a few ingredients. Egg crystals are genius for space. It's this, I don't know if you've ever used it before, but it's this, um, it looks like yellow sugar. And you know, mix it with water and it's like a raw egg you just, you've just been mixing around. And you can do so many wonderful things with that. It's, it's really great. Another one is um, freeze-dried vegetables. I never had it before and it is, it is also very fantastic. Um, you put some water in it, it sizzles a little bit because it absorbs the water and in no time you have vegetables like broccoli, green beans that are so close to a fresh vegetable. So that's, that's quite, and they're very light when you transport them, so a lot of benefits there. Um, for the dishes that we were cooking, um, soups were very popular. We had like seafood chowder, we had Russian borscht, all of those soups were like super popular. Um, and we had a lot of um, fusion kitchen. Um, things like uh, Spanish-inspired dishes. Uh, I once made, together with Jahaida, who's from Puerto Rico, we made a, a crossover between lasagna and enchil enchilada, and it was really a, a fantastic dish. Um, and then another thing, apart from um, the soups, for example, is and, and those fusion uh, meals that we made, um, is bread. We had a bread machine and we were baking all kinds of things and that was also as soon as we had the opportunity to to make bread because for example on a pre-prepared day we were not allowed to make bread but as soon as we had a moment uh, an, op an occasion to make bread we would just do it and experiment with it and add nuts walnuts and stuff like that and that was also super popular so those things a lot of comfort food actually a lot of comfort food a lot of food that relates to people's youth um, and a lot of cross-cultural experimentation because we had a very cross-cultural uh, crew. Uh, Puerto Rican, Russian-American, African-American, Belgian-Canadian. So, and that, that generated a very nice diversity of, uh, of things. It's so interesting hearing you talk about that because it's so not what I would think people would eat on Mars. Well, the thing is, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect this to eat on Mars, but the thing is, um, it's not difficult. Yeah. It's totally not difficult. You just make a good selection of shelf stable ingredients they're not too heavy and then you have some very basic appliances to cook with and that's it and you can do and, and you can do amazing things and the impact the impact on your on your physical health the impact on your individual psychology and the impact on crew cohesion are so huge that i can imagine not doing it the thing is for me the future of this all of this discussion on food is there's going to be a combination i'm not i'm not imagining people being having time to cook every single day but allowing that as a as a, as a as an, an additional strategy is going to be is going to be the solution i think mm -hmm. uh, some days you're just too busy and you don't want to cook and which makes perfect sense of course so it's like normal life <laughs> yes exactly yeah. um so uh we have another question about the mission which uh is from gabriel uh and it's what was the most challenging moment of your mission oh, the most challenging that's that's another good question my god um, it's actually an experiment that I set up myself. I did a social engineering experiment, so just to get back to my Starship PhD. Um, so I'm approaching Starship design as from an integrated hybrid field in which ecosystems, social systems and technological systems are coming together. So I do have an interest in social systems and that's what I've been uh, researching during the mission as part of my personal research. Um, very interested to see how people cope and how people try to improve during an isolation mission like this. Now, certain morning I had an idea that I wanted to present to the crew. And after the morning, uh, after breakfast, I basically told my crew, I want to offer my commander role to you. If anybody wants to take over, I'm okay with that. And to my surprise, four out of my five crew members were interested to be the commander. Mm -hmm. So I set up a commander switch experiment, and which was uh, three days uh, out of a week, somebody else would completely take over command, I would take a step back, rules would be changed, and uh, we would just go along with it. And then after that experiment, we would all come uh, sit down together and uh, talk about the experience. Now, this was incredibly useful. This is very interesting. I'm actually writing a TED book about my mission, and this will be part of that TED book, um, because it, it taught me so much about myself, about being a leader, about working with people. Uh, one of the things that happened is they, 
my crew started to understand me much better, which is of course beneficial for me. But also, and this was, I'm not saying it's the, it was the most challenging thing of the mission, but it was definitely challenging. Sometimes they came up with solutions that were better than mine. And that was not always very easy um, to accept that. Like, oh, damn it, that actually works better. Or that little twist, tweak of the rule, of a rule that actually works better. And then you have to put your ego aside and just accept it. And so what I started to do is I started to, accum uh, to absorb uh, those strategies that actually look that actually work better in my own leadership style. So by the end of the mission, my own leadership style was actually a hybrid of myself and my crew, and this was quite the experience. I mean, it's it's probably one of the most significant experiences for me during that that whole mission. It's really fascinating. Um, so we have a, a question about your art here. Mm -hmm. um, it says, "Art's a notoriously tough field to make a living on. How do you fund your works?" Yeah. Um, another question I, I regularly get. Um, I do have a professor position, although I'm working internationally and I'm doing a lot of travel. Um, I have a professor position in an arts college in Belgium and luckily I have a position as a advisor. I'm a thesis advisor. And so I can do part of my work long distance. So that gives me some basic income for my rent and my, my bread. Um, and then every individual project is individually funded. It, um, it's always, it's, I'm always, um, I'm usually invited to set up a project somewhere. And then one or more institutions pull together some resources. And sometimes we do additional fundraising ourselves. Like in New York City, I built a biomod, which was exhibit, which was finalized somewhere in January this year. And we did crowdfunding for that. We used Indiegogo to raise additional money. Um, so it's usually uh, very specific for each project that we look what but bu what budget is available and usually the people that invite me they already have some budget available and then we try to add things um, also I use a lot of recycled materials in my artworks my artworks are usually dealing almost always dealing with sustainability in one way or another so we re we repurpose a lot of materials like my biomod project the project in which I build ecosystems inside computer networks those computer components are all used, are all taken from e-waste. So I teach people all over the world how to turn e-waste into functioning units, and that is usually not very expensive. So it's a combination of things, really. Um, of course, if I would have followed the argument, like, oh my God, it's so difficult to make a living uh, as an artist, and you know, I, I would have never done it, but. I was so passionate about it. I couldn't. I, I was just. I just had to do it. And now I'm. I'm okay. I can. You know. And, and I have this hybrid practice of art and science. And you know. I can. Uh, yeah. I can survive. Um. Yeah. You fill a really interesting niche, being sort of like on the boundary of art and science. Mm -hmm. Do you think that one community is more challenging to work with than the other, or? No. The, 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 no. They. They. Each community, the artists and the, the art community and the science community, they have their challenges. Um, I think the challenge of working with scientists is sometimes that they're um, so absorbed with their own field that sometimes it's a little difficult for them to step out and not just intellectually but also um, time-wise it's not always easy to work with them because they're so busy all the time so really to get them really sit down and just forget about many things and just take a screwdriver and start building with us is not always easy um, what I don't find difficult is to move scientists into an artist mode. That is actually a myth that it, this would be like, you know, artists are like this and then scientists are the other way, completely the other way. No, you can perfectly, um, I've, I've had hardcore engineers turned into artists by working with me. I mean, turning, uh, absorbing an artist's perspective very quickly while working with me. It's all about communication. It's not difficult at all. Um, the challenging thing with artists is usually their ego. Um, artists are, are develop themselves within a culture which is all about ego and all about self-promotion uh, and not just self-promotion but also very much on a daily basis working on your personal profile to make it in that very competitive world. And that sometimes makes it easy to work with them because if they can't just take a step back and be part of a bigger group of a bigger community dynamic dynamic it's it does become difficult for example if an artist shows up to work on a community art project that i'm setting up and actually just wants to use 
the structure that we're building as a gallery to put his, his or her own work, yeah, that's not really contributing. I mean, and you, you have to, you have to, you know, you have to take a different approach. So, you know, each scene has its own challenges and you, you learn to work with that. Um, so there's a related question here, which is which part of art do you see most related to science and why? Hmm. Well, there is a whole field of uh, technologically mediated art. Uh, there's all kinds of names for it. It's, it used to be called new media art, and now it's media art, but it's also called intermedia art. <laughs> Actually, I don't care at all what it's called, but it's technology. It's art that uses a lot of technology. And I guess there is a lot of interest there. Um, artists that are working with that are easily drawn towards science and then start to include science in their artworks. Um, I think more traditional forms of contemporary art like uh, hardcore conceptual art um, painting, they tend to be much more further away from, from the field of, of science. Now the thing is that this field of technologically mediated art is not taken seriously very much by the official artwork, art world. There's a few reasons for that. First of all, it's, um, it's not as easy, um, it's not easy to market that stuff, like a painting is an investment, so that's, it, it works, it functions perfectly well in an art market. Those technological artworks that break down very easily and are, are interactive, but you have a, you need a whole manual to set it up and s stuff like that. They're not they don't they're not being collected that easily, so there's not so much market value there. Um, also, and that's um, a critique I have in that field is that sometimes um, they fall into the trap of hocus pocus, and it's much more a a gizmo or a technique that's being demonstrated, but as a poetic statement, as a statement about the human condition, about human life, about what it means to be here, um, is lacking. And then it might not be very strong as an artwork, and it's kind of logical that the art world doesn't really pick that up. On the other hand, what you also have is within that same field is that artists are sometimes a little blinded by science and they embrace something scientific, and typically artists love, and I really don't like that, they love blackboards with mathematical formula written on it with chalk. I mean, that's something you find in art installations. It's a little less now, but it used to be very popular. The thing that's still very popular is artists wearing white lab coats, and then that it suddenly becomes art. Then I'm like, come on. Uh, it's a little, yeah, not very deep either, so, you know. On one hand, um, I think the art world is a little conservative, it's not very open for new ideas. I mean, it's not a little conservative, it's actually very conservative. And on the other hand, I think sometimes within the mixing of art and science, things t are a little um, first degree. And uh, I understand that they don't find their way in the arts. Mm. Um, so we have another question here from Sanjoy, which is, where do you see yourself in five years? Um, hmm. Good question. My goal is really to contribute as much as I can to bringing um, human culture, human civilization in outer space. So anything I can contribute to make that happen. And the thing is, I think if I would stay on a level in which it's just um, speculative, I would kind of get frustrated after some time. So I'm really hoping I'm not saying that I see myself there in five years, but I'm really hoping that within five years I will have at least contributed to something f that physically gets in outer space, you know. So I really want to connect more with the physicality of outer space somehow. I don't know how it's going to happen, but that's really my goal or my hope. Um, we'll see. It's My life has been so pretty unpredictable. I mean, five years ago I would have never guessed I would I would be doing what I'm doing now. So it's the advantage of being an artist, of course. You can take all these unexpected paths and just explore. Um, so for upcoming artists, what advice do you have to get their work recognized and move up to the point of being invited like you to different projects? Um, well, first of all, it's about developing a language that is rooted in contemporary life. I think too many art schools are training people to legitimize their work in terms of recent art history. They, I hear young artists talking about their work and they immediately bring up all recent artists and philosophers to legitimize their work. 
And then I think something is wrong. We're not moving forward by just legitimizing work by referring to the past. I think it's important to be aware of the past and be aware where you come from and what your influences are, but I don't think it's enough to legitimize your work. What I believe as an artist to legitimize your work are two things. First of all, you as a person have a unique set of interests, which is still mystifying me. We're with like so many billion people and still every person is this unique configuration of interests and perspectives. And that's what you need to discover. And it's usually a long walk and then you end up with yourself again. In the beginning when I was making art, I wasn't making art with biology, but now it makes perfect sense that I'm using biology in my art because that's, you know, that's so close to me and it takes a while before you discover that. So you need to find those things that you really are close to you and don't take much effort because they are you and you just are so passionate about it. So it don't matter. you don't have to artificially figure out an original concept. It just flows. Second thing is that I think it's very crucial for artists to connect with what's happening today. Artists need to be in the world. You don't need to be in galleries and art schools. You need to get out of there. You can use those things like schools and galleries, but that's not your world. You need to be in the world. It's very important to realize what the hell is going on and to make work that is somehow related to that. It can be very abstract, can be very poetic, I don't mind. So if you combine being in the world, which is constantly evolving, your own set of interests, you'll make something that can actually make a difference and it's not something that people are just falling asleep with. And then the second thing is, there is no way around, is networking. You have to get out there. If you hate it, if you don't like to go to openings, if you don't like social media, if you don't like to talk about your work, it's absolutely fine. It's not part of, you don't have to be an artist like that, but you need somebody else to do it for you. Otherwise, you're <laughs> not going to make it. Um, so, as sort of a related question, if you have any suggestions for scientists who are interested in a career in art, or at least collaborating with artists. Um, yeah, where to start, right? If I'm around, you should just come over and work with me <laughs> and with my teams. No, seriously, that's the best way to uh, to really. I mean, working yeah. in these communities that I set up is is definitely a way to to just very hands on discover what it is all about, and you can after the collaboration you can take off on your own. Um, I did a few art school trainings. I did uh, an yeah. evening art school and I did a postgraduate art school and that really helped me to uh, refine my thoughts on art. But also I moved to London for one year after my PhD and I had a mentor, uh, a famous photographer and he was my mentor for one year and that really shaped my vision on the arts. So. There is no way around it. You somehow have to connect either with education, either through collaboration, either through mentorship. You will have to uh, expose yourself to people that are actually doing it. It's not enough by watching internet and just trying to figure out things through magazines or internet. You really need people to help you out with that. So that's the only way forward. And it can get different shapes. But um, do some training. Do some... Um, start collaborating with an arts collective. They're probably very interested to have you because your uh, scientists are, are very welcome usually in, in arts communities. So, you know, connect with people that are actually active in art and can translate the experience and then you'll start learning your about your own capacities and your own interests. That's that's what I would suggest. Excellent. Um, so where do you get your inspirations from? My inspirations come from... Um, everything. <laughs> it sounds so cliche, but it's pretty much, I'm interested in, there's very few things that I'm not interested in. Um, commercial sports, I'm not interested. I'm not, I'm not inspired by baseball or football or soccer, for example. Uh, but pretty much everything of human civilization, I'm very fascinated by. Um, I have a huge interest in history and I, I read a lot about history and that really helps me to contextual, to place my work and to see how I can proceed. I'm interested in science fiction as well. Um, I'm a gamer. Uh, I also DJ occasionally. So all of these things that are typically outside of what you would expect being part of arts, especially in Europe, we have a very aristocratic idea of what art should be. In America it's much more uh, open. Uh, popular culture is considered part of the arts in, in America, but not in Europe. Um, so all these other fields, science, science fiction, history, philosophy, popular culture, are just feeding me on an, an every, every single day. I think what I'm really focused on mostly is how I can connect things. I'm just a big connector. I just connect. For example, the Bayamod in the Philippines is a connection of community building, 
Biomod as a community art project, but it brings in the whole issue of e-waste, its installation art, and I actually, while Biomod is actually considered new media art because it contains these computers, I actually also collaborated with traditional wood carvers in the Philippines and they added to the overall artwork. So I'm always open for any perspective and trying to bring that together and that's I think my main role in my community is that I'm trying to, to be the person that is mediating and, and making a convincing statement with all of these influences. Fantastic. So um, we're going to wrap it up with just two last questions um, since we're getting to the end of the hour. Um, so the first is how did you become a TED Fellow? And the second is how can we follow your work online? Um, TED Fellow is you just apply. That's it. There's nothing more to it than that. I applied mostly, you, you have to submit some sort of project. Uh, it's important for a TED Fellowship that you have already accomplished something that you can put on the table. It's not enough to have ideas. They will not select you. You have to show that you're competent to pull it off. Um, and the projects you pull off should somehow uh, have a deeper impact or a potential to change uh, things dramatically. Uh, for example, the project that I got selected through was Biomod, doing this very experimental art in places like the Philippines and North America and Europe all over the place uh, with all these very important themes that are relevant for the future uh, basically convinced them to select me, the art science combination. Um, community is also important for TED. If, you some, if you're just a solitary inventor, it's gonna be more difficult to get selected for the TED fellowship, I'm quite sure. Uh, but it's, you know, it could, it could happen still. Um, yeah, that's that's a t and now I'm a senior fellow, and you can only become a senior fellow when you're a regular fellow. So that that's that's what happens. And definitely, if you're interested, you should apply. It's uh, an amazing community of people. Uh, the most interesting about the whole TED experience for me is not so much the TEDsters, uh, but it's actually the fellow TED fellows. Just seeing other people carving out their way is so so useful. So I'll, yeah, if you have a chance, it would be wonderful to see you there. Um, and the other question was... About how we follow your work. Oh, following my work is I have a, I have a community page on Facebook. It's, um, you know, the Facebook URL followed by Angelo Vermeulen Community. You can just find it. Um, or Twitter. But my Facebook page is probably the most, the most updated. My website is a disaster, so please don't look at my website. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll be okay in, a, in like half a year, but right now it's, it's, it's not a good website. So Facebook is, is the way to go. Excellent. Um, so thanks very much, Angelo. I think we're going to wrap it up today because Angelo's got a very big day today with a big public event tonight. Um, but thank you all for your questions, and look for TTA again coming up uh, in December. Thank okay. you all. Bye-bye.